We just left off with Frank Paris had walked off with the first How to Do Deep Puppet. Right. Uh, but before we, we finish that, I want to backtrack a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, in February of 1948, Clarabelle was introduced. Tell me how that happened. Okay, well, our first Clarabelle was Bobby Keeshan, who later became Captain Kangaroo. And Bobby worked for me when I was doing that early morning radio show, way before we ever even thought of Howdy Doody. What was he doing? Well, uh, he was a page at NBC. And pages were paid $40 a week. Every kid wanted to be a page at NBC. These were kids that had aspirations of becoming a radio, whatever, singers, actors, producers. Many, many people started as uh, pages. I mean, big guys, Merv Griffin, guys like that. They, a lot of them got their starts as a page. Well, Keishan was a page, and you were only allowed to be a page for six months because they had a list as long as your arm of kids that wanted to be there. And his uh, desk where he worked was right outside of my office. So I knew him quite well. I'd say, hi, Bobby, hi, Buffalo, and whatever. So he said, uh, look, he said, my six months is over. In, in another couple of weeks, he says, uh, could you possibly use me, you know, hire me for to do something? I said, yeah. I said, I, uh, I was doing the Triple B Ranch at the time, and, and uh, I was doing the early morning show. I said, you can... Handle song pluggers for me. It's a big chore, you know. They're on your tail all the day long to use their music. And I was on 18 hours a week in the morning. I was a song plugger's delight. So I said, yeah, I, I'll, I'll. he was sort of a gopher for me. So when we did our very first Howdy Doody show, he held cue cards for me. He printed them and held them for me next to the camera. So one day... Uh, I don't know, we were running a little late, and I needed something. A kid had won a prize or something, and I needed it. I said, Bobby, get me that uh, little prize for the little kid. So he got a prize, walked in on camera with a T-shirt. It was hot back then. <laughs> so I gave the prize to the kid, and I said, thank you, Bobby. And he walked off, and the boss said, hey, at Warren Wade, the uh, head of television, he said, I saw that guy walk on camera with a T-shirt. He said, is that good television? I said, what do you mean? Well, if he's going to be on, let's dress him up or something. Let's not let him walk on with a T-shirt. Well, the only thing that fit him was this uh, zebra-striped clown suit that we had in the uh, prop room or the wardrobe room. So I said, do you mind wearing that, Bobby, when you're holding cue cards? And if you walk in, you got a, a costume? No, that's fine. I don't care. I'm... So one day he walked in. Uh, I needed something, and he came on camera and gave it to me, and I said, thank you, Bobby. He said, you're welcome, Bob. And he walked off, and Warren Wade called me after. He said, hey, that guy with a clown suit? Yeah. He talked. I said, what do you mean? He said, he talked to you on the, on the show. And I said, well, yeah. He said, well, don't let him talk. I said, why? He said, well, if the union comes in and he talks, we're going to have to pay him actor scale. I said, okay. So, Bobby, look, the next time, don't talk when you come on camera. Okay, fine. Yeah, I didn't have anything to say anyway, so <laughs> he started not talking. Well, he would have his clown suit up to here, and that, that's all. He wasn't a clown up here, just the clown suit. Well, I believe it was, uh, I don't know, March. Uh, Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus came to uh, Madison Square Garden. And every day they'd send over an act for us. And we would plug the circus, which was a lot of plugs for them for no money. Of course, we got a great act for no money, one day a juggler and one day something else. And this one particular day, uh, Emmett Kelly and Felix Adler, two of the greatest clowns in the world, came over to be on our show. So they walked in and they saw Keishan sitting there, this is before the show, of course, and in the clown suit, and they said, well, what's, what's he? And, well, he just wears that. Well, why isn't he a clown all over? And we said, well, <laughs> I don't know. He, he said, we know what we're going to do today. We'll, we'll make him a clown on television. So they had this paint. They put the paint on, gave him the big bulbous nose, the big smile. And we christened him Clarabelle. And it was like that for over 2,500 shows. He never talked because it started to be cheaper that way. So we gave him two horns, a yes horn and a no horn, a happy horn and a very dejected horn. We copied that from, Groucho, from Harpo Marx, who didn't talk. 
And uh, it, as I said, it, it started out that way because it was cheaper in the beginning. But he wound up making a lot of money. <laughs> who, who did the makeup uh, for each show? Was it was it Dick Smith? Well, now Dick Smith was he started on our show. That's right. Then he used to make up Clarabelle, and he, he used to. Oh, Dick was a marvelous, marvelous makeup man. And he Dick, was just. Dick marvelous. Smith was the the staff NBC. Uh, he he actually created the makeup department in NBC. Absolutely, he was marvelous. Then he went on to do some of the greatest movies ever made. Dick was a great guy. So wh where did Clarabelle come from, the name Clarabelle? Oh, Eddie Keene just just came up with that name Clarabelle, thought it was a silly name. And when I meet people in, in uh, personal appearances or autograph sessions and the girls come up and you say, you know what my name is? They say, what, they say, Clarabelle. <laughs> I say, no. <laughs> it's so cute. So the next month, Howdy Doody uh, ran for something. What did he run for? Well, we, uh, see, Frank Paris walked out of the studio with the puppet, and we never saw him again. Never saw the puppet again. Well, to finish that story later, uh, he, he tried to sue in, uh, uh, NBC. I don't know, they gave him a couple thousand dollars, and he incinerated the puppet. I mean, the puppet was completely destroyed. They decided nobody owed him. But anyway, here we are without a puppet. So, we had a vice president at the studio, Norm Blackburn. He was from California originally, and then he came to New York. And he knew a lot of people at Disneyland in California. Disney World is in Orlando, but Disneyland. And Disneyland had just opened up pretty around that time, wasn't it? Wasn't it well, they'd, yeah, they'd been in business though for a while, but there was a lovely gal there by the name of Velma Dawson. Now, Velma Dawson was a puppeteer. She made puppets and a good friend of this uh, Norm Blackburn. Now, this is the night that Frank Paris walked out of the studio with the old Howdy. Ugly Duty, we call him. Not Howdy Duty, Ugly Duty. He walked out with Ugly Duty. And we got to have a puppet on the show. What are we going to do? Well, we called Velma Dawson that night after 6 o'clock, after the show was over. And... Norm said, now, this is Bob Smith. He does a so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. I wasn't Buffalo Bob that early. I was Bob Smith, Mr. Smith. And I gave her the voice, said, this is what he sounds like. What do you think he should look like? And within a week or so, we had these beautiful drawings, and the minute we saw that face, as we know Howdy today, but we said, that's it. Go make him. And she made Howdy Doody right away and got him back to New York within maybe two weeks. But in the interim, we wanted Howdy on the show. The sponsors wanted him on the show. So what we said was that, see, this was a, 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 an election year. This is 1948. So Howdy, we decided he would run for all the president of all the kids in the United States. And... We had no ratings back then. There was no Nilsson or no Arbitron or Hooper or whatever. And we thought, we got to get some way to show, the sales department said, that people are watching the Howdy Doody show. So we ran this, uh, I guess the contest was run back, though, when it was the old, the old Howdy Doody. I mean, the original Ugly Doody. That's when it started. Yeah, that's when the, uh, that's when the uh, promotion started. If you're for Howdy Doody for president, then you got to write in and send a self-addressed stamped envelope and we'll send you a button that says I'm for and then a picture of Howdy, Howdy Doody. So I made one mention and I think the sales department ordered 10,000 buttons. Well, about Wednesday of that following week, my gosh, the sales department, the mailing department said, what the world did you guys do on this show? We're up to our butts here in mail. I can't tell you the exact numbers of the, of the uh, responses that we got because there were only six stations. See, we, when we started, we were on the full NBC network. By full NBC network, I mean New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Schenectady, Washington, and Baltimore. There were only six stations. But we had something like five or six times as many responses as there were television sets in that whole area. 
proving that there were kids that would go to the neighbor's house and watch the show, and there would be eight or ten kids watching the show, and they all wrote in for a, a I'm for Howdy Doody button. Well, this, is, this got us sold out immediately. I mean, we were sold out, and big sponsors, Colgate's, uh, Kellogg's, uh, Welch's Grape Juice. I mean, big quality products. So now we don't have a Howdy Doody, though. Frank walked out on us. Well, how, I mean, how, approximately how big was re that response? Was it? I would say that we, we wound up having to buy about 250,000 buttons. We thought we were either fired or we were going to have to come up with a lot of money. Was that a shock? I mean, had you seen how popular how do you, well, a Puppet Playhouse had been at that point? No way that we would, we would know other than through this tremendous response that we got. And if we had five or six people watching each television set, or an average of that, well, this, this is phenomenal. This is the greatest success story, I guess, in the history of radio or television. So we were immediately sold out. Niles Trammell was the president of NBC, and he was on uh, speaking terms with people like Ed Little, who was the chairman of the board for Colgate's. He said, you want to sell toothpaste? You got it. And that's a great story about Welch's, about the Colgate toothpaste, which I'll tell a little bit later. But I do want to get into the fact of what we did uh, when, without Howdy. We uh, knew that we were going to get him hopefully in three weeks. Uh, because you still had a live audience, the, and the kids, oh, yeah. the kids were there. Oh, yeah. So you had to explain to them why Howdy Doody wasn't there, right? Yeah, we had a very good reason. Because Howdy was running for president of all the kids in the United States. And he was campaigning in Portland, Oregon. We picked it the farthest place we could think of. And he met Mr. X, his running mate. And he is absolutely handsome. And he knows that Mr. X is going to get votes from all the girls. So Howdy's going to have to have some plastic surgery. But don't worry, kids. It won't, it won't hurt. It's not that it's easier than having your tooth clean, teeth cleaned. It's it just easy. Didn't want to scare the kids, see. Well, in the meantime... We got another puppet being made in California. But the sponsors wanted Howdy on the air to do commercials with me. So we just got any old puppet, dressed him up like Howdy was going to be dressed up, the new Howdy, and wrapped bandages around his face so that the kids couldn't see him because he was undergoing plastic surgery. So Howdy was there doing commercials with me, which, <clears throat> pardon me, made the kids happy. And it was like that until... We had the new Howdy, and three weeks later when the new Howdy was there, we bandaged him, <laughs> and then on the air, we had the unveiling of our new Howdy duty, and we took off the bandages, and then kids saw Howdy as he is known today. Isn't that a wild story? That's fantastic. <laughs> How, um, we didn't really touch on this in the beginning. You had never worked with puppets before. What were the challenges early on of working with puppets on a live television show? Well, I just, uh, I just talked to the puppets like they were real people. And when we first started, I would talk for Howdy live. We'd have one camera on me, another camera on just Howdy. And then I'd say, isn't that right, Howdy? And as I was looking at Howdy, there was also a television set, a monitor behind me. I'd say, isn't that right, Howdy? I'd give a direct cue, and then they'd punch up the camera that where just Howdy was on the screen, and when I would see that just Howdy was on the screen, I'd say, isn't that right, Howdy? I'd say, ha ha, you're right, Buffalo Bob, and whatever. And we did that, and then the kids would come in and they'd see that, and they'd look for me to Howdy, and they'd say, well, who's talking for whom? See, Howdy lived as far as they were concerned. He, he was live. So the boss said, look, we can't do this anymore. We, we got to... You're not a ventriloquist. We got to record the puppets. Got to record their voices. So I said, fine. So from then on, when we would start a rehearsal, we were scripted. First thing we would do is record all the puppets' voices in sequence, from page one to page thirty, or however long the show was. Record them on a disc. This was a sixteen-inch acetate disc, thirty-three and a third RPM. And we would take as we started the rehearsal and we recorded the puppets in sequence, we take about two and a half seconds pause between each one of the puppets' speeches. 
so that when it was a turn for the puppet to talk, the engineer now, the turntable is going around, the engineer would have his hand on the record. And I'd say, what do you think, Howdy? And boom, he'd take his finger off the record, and it would go around, and he'd say, ho, ho, I think you're right, Puff Puff. <laughs> then it would hold, hold the record until it was time for Howdy's next speech. And then I would do my live speech or whatever, and then whatever, there was a, whatever right, Howdy? And up, and then Howdy would come in. This is how primitive it was. There wasn't tape. They didn't have tape recordings back then. There wasn't even wire recording. Wire recording preceded tape recording. This was just a little wire. Quality was bad. But then when tape came in, this would have been much simpler to just push buttons. It had been very simple. But we didn't have that. But the fact that he was recorded was great because I could record how he's singing, and then I could come into the shot and sing along with him. And people never, that's why people never knew that I did the voice, because I was always in there with him. I was not a ventriloquist. None of us was a ventriloquist on the show. I mean, Dayton Allen talked for uh, Mr. Bluster, the inspector, the club dub Later, Bobby Nicholson did all that. And uh, we all recorded the, the puppets' voices so that we could be in the shot with the puppeteers. It's, Amazing, quite, a, it's yeah. quite an operation. Who, who yeah. wrote the scripts? Eddie Keene. He is really one of the biggest reasons for the success of Howdy Doody. He wrote such marvelous stuff. He had a great feel. He, uh, he was camp director and he worked with kids. But the songs that he wrote, you see people say, what, 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 what was the success of Howdy? Well, first of all, we were not an educational show per se, but we did try to teach the kids in a more subtle way without their realizing that they were being taught. And we had songs like, If you think you use your feet when you cross the street, here's a surprise in the daytime or night. Look around left and right and cross the street with your eyes. Now, if you can get 10 or 12 million kids thinking about that, they just might think twice before they leap in the path of an oncoming car. Well, what, what else did you uh, teach children? Well, be kind to animals. That's good advice. Be kind to animals, they'll treat you nice. And just like you and me, they have to be fed. And just like you and me, they have to be told when to go to bed. Be kind to animals, they'll think you're grand. All day they'll follow you and lick your hand. And take them for a regular walk. And if they could talk, they'd say, thanks for being kind to animals. We love to be treated that way. <laughs> I want to cry when I hear those songs. Save your pennies, soon you'll have a nickel. Save your nickel, soon you'll have a dime. Save your dimes, soon you'll have a quarter. And a quarter order, make you sort of glad you saved the dimes. We, your, eat your vegetables, is that one too? No, we didn't. Uh, we, didn't uh, we were more for Milky Ways. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So it was, it was really, you saw it as entertainment for children. And then and, and the, the educational value was just really very subtle and but straightforward. Slipping it in, yeah. Slipping it in. It, it, and we taught Brotherhood back in uh, 1948. My face may not be handsome, I may be dark or fair, but here in America you're welcome. Everybody is welcome everywhere. Now that's Brotherhood in 1948. That's fantastic. Uh, you were telling me about the writer on the show. Who Eddie. Eddie, yeah, who... who uh, Wrote all these songs. F for, for the entire run? For the first seven years. For seven years. And then Eddie... Uh, well, I won't say he, he was written out, but uh, he, he, had, he had served very, very well in his capacity. And then we got a hold of two writers from uh, William Morris Agency, Billy Gilbert and Jack Weinstock, who wrote the great stage play, How to Succeed in Business Without Even Trying. And they were, uh, they, they were a little more hep than, than, uh, than Eddie. Not that Eddie wasn't hep, but they were a little more pro progressing with the times. And that's when we were on every Saturday morning from 10 to 10.30. Now, as far as the schedule is concerned, in, in 48, um, you, I think in August, I, I see it here, uh, you're on Monday through Friday now, That's right. right. Monday through Friday, 5.30 to 6. 5.30 to 6 on the full network, NBC. Full NBC network, yeah. Um, uh, talk about some of the characters that were created for How to Duty and describe them for us. Well, first of all, it was Clarabelle. The clown. 
Clarabelle was a clown, Bobby Keishan first, then later Bobby Nicholson, and then later Lou Anderson. Now, Bobby Nicholson later became Mr. Cobb, J. Cornelius Cobb, who ran the general store, Corny Cobb. And then, uh, well, actually, Keishan was uh, Clarabelle for a couple of years, and then Bobby Nicholson was Clarabelle for a couple of years. But he didn't like putting on this makeup every day. And, and then Lou Anderson was a great, great uh, singer and musician. He was one of the Honey Dreamers, great vocal group. And we knew Lou and uh, asked him if he would like to be Clarabelle, and he said, oh, I'd love it. And he just fit into the role so marvelous. It was Clarabelle who said on the last show, you know that story. Mm -hmm. Clarabelle never talked for 2,542 shows. And on the last show, we did an hour special, and he picked up a card to start the show that said surprise. And for the entire show, we tried to figure out what the surprise was. And finally, we had about 30 seconds to go, and I said, Clarabelle, what is your surprise? And he said, you can talk? Well, if you can talk, say something. And I shook him, I say something. And he looked right into the lens, and the camera dollied in on him, and he said, goodbye, kids. Believe me, there wasn't a dry eye in the studio. Very, very traumatic. So that's the story of Clarabelle. Now we needed a villain on the show, so we got uh, Phineas T. Bluster. P.T. Bluster, named after P.T. Barnum of Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus. See, we started <clears throat> with just a clubhouse, what we called a clubhouse. But then we went into the circus motif. All kids love circus. And a, we needed a villain. Uh, so how he inherited this circus was the storyline that Eddie came up with. He inherited this circus from his grandfather or whatever. And uh, Mr. Bluster always trying to get the circus away from Howdy Doody. He was an old vaudevillian, as the story goes. He was a lovable character. He was a great, great puppet. And then Dilly Dally. Well, uh, 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 Phineas T. Buster was a puppet. I just want to... Oh, he was a... I want to clarify. Oh, yeah. These are puppets. He was an old man, glasses. Exactly. Yeah, he had the low voice and guttural. Okay. He was a great puppet. Then Dilly Dally mm -hmm. was sort of his little foil, his little stooge, Dilly Dally. The only puppet in the world that could wiggle his ears. He was so cute. So it was Howdy and me against Bluster and Dilly. But and Dilly. De describe Dilly Dally, a young, young boy. Young little boy, a little red sweatshirt with a D on it. And we asked everybody what the D stood for, and nobody ever knew. It was from Dutyville High. He was a water boy at <laughs> Dutyville High. <laughs> Dilly was a great puppet. Great, uh, round glasses. Little round glasses, little that's cap, right. right. Very good, yeah. Right. Okay. Then there was the inspector, John J. Fiduzel, America's number one, boing, private eye. Red Winker's eye. It was John J. Fiduzel. Then it was Captain Scuttlebutt, who ran the tugboat in Dutyville Harbor. He was a great puppet, too. And uh, well, those were the only... Oh, the Grandpa Judy, Howdy's uh, grandfather. I did the voice for him, too. Interesting how these puppets came into being. We, we knew that we needed a backup for the original Howdy because we did a show from the steps of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., and I'm an American Day, with Joe Lewis, the world's heavyweight boxing champ, and uh, Attorney General Tom Clark and Vice President Alvin Barkley. It was a very momentous day, a very delightful day for all of us. And anyway, I brought Howdy there in a little... Uh, fiberglass case. And when we checked them in the airline, we never should have checked them in the airline. Uh, I brought them home and I never looked at them. I brought them into the studio the next day and I opened it up and Howdy's head was split right straight, right straight through. Well, they worked feverishly at them, got them in shape for the show. But we decided right then and there we had to get a second puppet in case something should happen in the original. Well, I don't know how many times they tried, five, six, seven, to make a, a, an identical puppet. Well, you can't make an identical puppet because they're all hand-formed hand with plastic wood. So the one of the puppets, uh, we made him into Grandpa Duty. <laughs> Put sideburns on him, and he was Grandpa Duty. Another one was the inspector. 
put a mustache on him, and he, he was the inspector. And uh, then the one that we could use, the one that I guess was closest to the original Howdy, that we could use in a pinch, uh, which we had used on the show a couple of times. For instance, if Howdy was in uh, the puppet stage here with Mr. Bluster, whatever, and right after he had to be in a Wonder Bread commercial, maybe 30 feet away, we had to have a second puppet. We called him Double Duty. And he could have been used on a long shot, not a tight shot. If you had a tight shot, you'd recognize that it wasn't the same. I mean, I would, and those in the know would. So we called him Double Duty. He is in the Smithsonian right now with uh, Charlie McCarthy, Mortimer Snurd, Froggy the Gremlin. And then we needed another puppet uh, for when we did parades. Like, I, I, I did 13 Macy parades. And we couldn't have a puppeteer to, to work strings, so we had made another puppet without strings so that he could be in my arms or whatever and arm up and wave, and for pictures mainly. And we called him photo duty. So there's howdy duty and double duty and, and photo duty. So uh, let's see. I guess we went through most of the main characters on the show. And then there was Sandra Witch and Hazel Witch. Those were two witches. Well, initially there wasn't any female characters on the show. Oh, I like that's right. I was going to get the summer Princess Summerfall Winter Spring, right. who first was a puppet, first a puppet. But the gal that did the voice and operated the puppet, uh, we, we weren't terribly happy with this. And uh, see, we had so many uh, requests from licensees, people that wanted to make uh, clothing for girls. See, girls had no one to relate to, to relate to on the show. Everybody was male, so we wanted a gal. But the puppet was not the answer. Then we saw Judy Tyler on Channel 11 on PIX, WPIX. And we saw her, and she was about 17 or 18 at the time, and the most talented gal that we ever saw in our lives, sing, dance. She could sing like Judy Garland. She could sing like Ethel Merman. She was just great. So we got in touch and asked her if she wanted to be in the Howdy Doody show. And she came over to audition, and she was just elated. And then we had a big ceremony on this show where the puppet came to life. <laughs> and Judy came out dressed exactly as the puppet was dressed. And then that was one of the greatest, the greatest additions to our show with Judy Tyler, Princess Summer, Fall, Winter, Spring. She was just marvelous. Now, I just want to, I want to get clear in my mind of how you would do these shows, um, specifically with the puppeteers, and um, when, when you're in the shot, uh, or compared to, you mentioned the puppet stage, were there different, different elements uh, in, in each camera would, would, would pick up the, d the different areas? Oh, yeah. Describe that for me. Well, the, the, the uh, camera number one was a on a dolly. And the guy would dolly back while we run another camera. He'd get that set for the next shot coming up. Camera two and camera three, they were on pedestals where the guys would move them around wherever they were easy to move. They just moved them to wherever they were supposed to be moved. And it was a question of anticipation. You'd be on one camera and then the technical director in the control room would tell camera three over to the Wonder Bread set or the Ovaltine or whatever. It was a question of rehearsal. We rehearsed quite a bit on the show. We rehearsed at least uh, four hours every day. So you rehearsed four hours before... Uh, for the four, for the half hour show that you did exactly uh, at five thirty. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we'll take a break. 